Hello everyone, Russ of Aquarimax here. Um, I am excited to be here. Sorry, I was just uh, kind of pushing the limits there a little bit late. We already have 11 people, 12 people in and, and 11 uh, likes already, so nice. Frank the Tanks here, Hair Wade, Raistlin, awesome. Snailiantologist, Newt Scamander, Ken Malinsky. And let's see who else is in the house. Killcast, the House of Amethyst. Cool. So, I am loving garter snakes, uh, of course. And I've got three of them, and I'm just about to open the enclosure here. I put them in a tub so that we would make sure that you didn't, you weren't presented with an empty tank. I mean, initially you were, but uh, I wanted to make sure that you were able to see something when you looked into the tank, basically. So um, they are starting to hide a little bit more now because it's getting cooler. They're actually going to go down into brumation in about a month. So it's cool down time has, has officially started. And uh, so we're going to, uh, I fed them for the last time on, when was it? Sunday, I think. And not for the last time ever, of course, but before they start their their process of uh, brumation. So, Albatross Gaming in the house as well. Corey had a whole nest of garters. That's so awesome. Yeah, I love the way they poke out. They do that in here too. Zero, cool. Hey, Catherine, you made a live stream. That's awesome. Chris the Mad Aquarist is in the house. Oh, yeah. Those huge garter, garter snake hibernaculum. Uh, there's there's several of them up in Canada, and they're super cool. So, yeah, I love that they're communal too, basement pets. That's one of the reasons why I got them. I, I really like communal things. I just, it's a thing. I love communal creatures. I love the fact that uh, garter snakes are communal, that they're diurnal, that they're very, very, not only diurnal, but very active, uh, as well as being diurnal. And there you go, like that, Newt. That's how you do it. Um, so they, they're starting to lose their appetite a little bit. Um, they refuse food, food a lot more often than they usually do at this point because they are um, getting close to brumation. But they're still, like last time, one of them didn't want to eat and the other two did. And the time before that, he wanted to eat and the other two didn't. And, you know, and that's not normal. Normally, they're going to eat a ton of food. And they're, they're really, they want to eat twice a week. You know, garters will eat about twice a week. He got kind of freaked out in that top opening enclosure. That's kind of freaky for him. Um, I'm trying to see, is he out of focus? I mean, the lighting's not that good. Let me see if I can adjust the lighting. That should help a little bit. Yeah. Let's see if he will. I'm going to put him down, see what he does. If he'll play with us or if he's going to go hide. I don't know. We'll see. So you shouldn't feed them once they're cooled, of course, because they can't digest their food. What you do basically is. Uh, at the beginning of November or so, depending on where you are and when you want to do it, uh, you stop feeding them, let their digestive systems clear out. They still need to be at normal snake temperatures and then, um, you know, be able to thermoregulate just normally. You need to provide that thermal gradient for them. And then after a few weeks of that, you can start cooling them. And so my plan is for November to be the they're going to have several weeks just to stay warm and get rid of anything that's in their digestive system. And then, uh, well, the first couple of weeks of November, and then I'll start cooling them down, maybe two or three weeks of, uh, you know, cooler temperatures. And then I will uh, start cooling them down by turning off their basking light and leaving on the other lights so that they can still get warm. Uh, he's digging around in the back. I want to see if I can move this around because 
It's not very interesting to look at just the enclosure, but if we get to watch him crawling around, it's more fun. See, there he is, doing his thing. And then uh, after that, you can put them in a brumation chamber where it's quite cool, like in the mid-50s, and uh, leave them there for a few months. And then in March, you take them out, start warming them up. And Angela, hello. Oh yeah, garter snakes are so fun, partly because they are so active in the daytime, partly because they seem so curious, so willing to come out, see what's going on. Now, oh, Cheyenne geckos, you have communal mantises. That's cool. I know that some of them, like the ghost mantis, can be communal, so. And kill cast. Yeah, these, these are captive produced garters, which is, uh, you know, my preferred method. These are from Montana. These are uh, red-sided garters. There's a lot of confusion when that common name is used, which is why scientific names are good. This is the same subspecies as the California red-sided garter. I'm not the same subspecies, sorry. The same species, but not the same subspecies. The subspecies is uh, Parietalis, not um, Infernalis, which is what the California red-sided garter is. And they may not be quite as brilliant as the uh, California red-sided garter, some of the localities of that particular subspecies, but they're still pretty cool looking. I like them. They're pretty. Um, and garters with UVB? Well, I give mine UVB. I think it's beneficial. I know people have raised them for generations without it, so it's theoretically possible to survive without it. But uh, I give mine UVB, and I think it's good for them. I think they benefit from it. So, Frank, to take, they really max out at 12 inches. That's pretty small. Yeah, this species sometimes maxes out, this subspecies sometimes maxes out at that size. But these are all bigger than that. The males are probably around 18 inches-ish, and the females probably more than 24 at this point. Um... Oh, look who else is in the house. We've got Theropod Hunter, Sean Meister. So this plant is uh, a bird's nest fern. I think the scientific genus name is a Splenium, and it is a cultivar known as Leslie. So bird's nest fern Leslie. This one here, now while we're talking about the plant life in here, this is a lemon button fern. This one here is a Korean rock fern spreading along here. This one was a seedling that, you know, grew for quite a while, sprouted in here, and then mm, didn't do so hot. It's still barely alive, but the isopods seem to be eating the leaves, so I think it's on its way out, because they don't usually eat healthy plant material so much, unless they're starving. And then here is a Hanai snake plant cultivar. I'm not sure which one. One of the variegated Hanai cultivars. Um, so there we go. I can see them crawling around in the back there. That's Rufus over there. He's going to come check the camera out. They, they're really curious. I love that they're curious. And there's Jordan. Welcome, Jordan. Welcome, Tarantula B. So these snakes can be piscivorous, um, meaning fish eating. They can be. I have fed mine tilapia on occasion, but I usually give mine... Uh, well, I've given them a lot of reptilinks, and lately it's been mostly pinkies, because I ran out of reptilinks. Uh, large pinkies at this point, because the snakes are big enough, they can easily take large pinkies. And snakes like to eat several small items at once, rather than one really large item. And, you know, they're fairly small snakes still, so they'll take up to four large pinkies at a time. You know, this guy, this is Houdini here, he usually only takes one or two. Rufus will take sometimes two or three, and then... Ruby, who I still haven't taken out and I need to, um, Ruby will take uh, up to four. So, but they can be fish eaters. The main thing with feeding them fish is that you have to make sure it's a fish that does not contain thiaminase. So goldfish are out, uh, at least as a frequent dietary item. A goldfish now and then will hurt them, but if they are getting nothing but goldfish or other fish containing thiaminase, it will destroy thiamine, which is an important B vitamin, it's crucial and that will eventually cause neurological damage and if it's not addressed it will kill them so and raceland the magic potions are doing really well i just checked on them today um, they are i'm hoping to find some more babies soon but 
In the meantime, they're, they're thriving. They seem to be doing really well. Tarantula bee. Mm, nice pickups there. Those are some nice isopod species. And Newt, yes, you probably do hear some of the humans I share this house with. One of them is running the blender right now, in fact. Hmm. Yeah, I, I just don't feed my fish very often, except for some frozen tilapia once in a while, but I, I do that rarely. Um, and Heather, that's an interesting observation, especially since I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, Heather. Welcome to the stream, by the way, but... Um, let me know if these are the magic potions you isolated from your uh, gem mix. Because that would be really interesting if that's what's going on. So let's see if we can see some of the species that are in here. Uh, someone was just asking. Killcast. Sometimes they're under the water dish. Yeah, there's a few down there. Some clowns. You can see some babies, some adults. They're Armadillidium klugai Montenegro. Otherwise known as the clown isopod. There's a lot of them in here. Most of them are under this cork bark. When I move that cork bark, there are loads of them under there. They do pretty well in here. So, yeah. That is the species I have. And they do pretty well at cleaning out the, uh, the feces as well as the uh, snake sheds. Okay, Albatross Gaming. So it's some variety of Porcelia Levis. That's cool. There he goes in the corner. I need to take uh, Ruby out. And yes, Frank, when, I, when these snakes were little, they were getting worms with calcium supplementation and vitamin supplementation. And they were also getting, sorry, I'm going to put this back on the tripod for a minute so I can get Ruby out. They were also getting um, pinky pieces. I frozen thawed pinky pieces, of course. I would use a razor blade or a sharp knife and cut them into pieces. It's okay. Um, and that that worked pretty well. They they would do that. And of course the reptilinks. Here, I'm going to get Ruby out. I can see, you see the little snake checking me out there over by the bird's nest fern. Um, and Chris, thank you. Yes. The like button really helps. And okay, here comes Ruby, everybody. Just have to She's in this bin with some hides, lots of hides in it. She's coiled up in one of them, of course. There we go. And pull her out. They were actually sitting in their initial enclosure they had when they were very little. And you can see that Ruby's put on quite a bit of size. They were all just tiny little shavers when I first got them. Um, they were about a month old or so. Maybe even less than that. Somewhere around a month old when I got them from Don's Garter Snakes. He breeds quite a few different types of garters. He's local. And uh, he was at the expo in 2019. It was the September expo in 2019. It's okay. And I got them from him. So they have really put on some size, especially Ruby. She's so much bigger than, than the boys. Okay, I'm going to put back the chat, and we'll see, just kind of follow them around a little bit as they're roaming the enclosure, if we can see what they're doing. And thank you, Frank and Raislin, for the compliment about the setup. And I love the, yeah, the periscoping activity that they do when they're just checking everything out. It's super cool. I also love it when they climb up on these curly willow branches. And you probably can tell that the pothos is actually behind the tank. It's not actually in it. Um, how many isopods do you think are available in the pet trade? Well, it partly depends on whether you mean species or, or morphs and you know cultivars and stuff, variations, localities, all that stuff. I don't know. I would say there's probably over 100 nowadays. It's hard to say for sure. but Because I myself, including... Localities and morphs have about 40, and I don't have anywhere near what is available. So there, there's got to be over 100, I would say. So Killcast, good question. The garters don't eat the ice pods. They're not really interested in eating um, invertebrates with chitin. Uh, things like grasshoppers and stuff. Garters don't really eat a lot of that because they can't digest it very well. So 
I mean, I'm not going to say a garter has never eaten a grasshopper or anything like that. That would be silly. But like racers, for example, eat a lot of grasshoppers and they get a lot out of it because they can digest the chitin, but garters can't really digest it. So um, isopods fall into that category. They're also not really in their size range at this size. So, um, and Connor Schumacher, what size are Leucomelus dart frogs after four months? Well, that depends a lot on how much you feed them, really more than this, their age, honestly. Um, how much they're getting, uh, high quality food they're getting, and so on. Um, temperature could have some effect on that too. So it's hard to say. But I would say four months, in, and you're saying from four months after metamorphosing into a frog that I would assume. Definitely going to be bigger than your thumbnail by then, almost always. Monster-sized garters. There are some big ones out there. There's a giant garter species. Um, theropod hunter. Well, I'm, I've been better. Thank you for asking. I've been better. Um, but I'm, I think I'm on the recovery end of things now. Um, and Corey, your ball python acts like one just squishes the plants a lot worse. Yeah, these plants were picked specifically for being able to uh, handle garter snake issues. Um, basically being crushed by snakes a lot. And they do a good job. They just kind of spring back, which is nice. Um, speaking of things that uh, are in the garter enclosure, this, I got this because of uh, Emily at Snake Discovery's suggestion. Because I had a pile of the cork bark arranged a little bit differently. So it was under the UVB and the basking light here. It's their nice warm basking spot. But the problem is that Ruby was getting too heavy and she was knocking it over. And this is weighted. Not only is it weighted, it, it doubles as a hide. So I kind of made this stack. You can see I've got some cork bark down there and then I've got this, this uh, resin log that's weighted. And then I've got some more cork bark on the top. And they come up here, they hide in the layer under here as you can see that Houdini is doing right now. They go under here, a ruby like has a spot down here. She hangs out it in a lot. I don't think she's right there right now. But uh, yeah, it's, it's turned out to be really nice and she can't knock it over anymore because this is so nice and heavy. So, so Albatross ga Gaming, Velvet Worms from Peter out, will you get one? Well, I don't know, uh, I need to find out more about those guys. Oh, there's Ruby. She's just hanging out over here. Oh, I just, she doesn't like sudden movements. N none of them do really. And so I have to be careful and I just kind of drop the cork bark and that sort of reeked them out a little bit. Um, they're very friendly when they're, you know, when we're playing with them. Um, the, the velvet worms, I would love to do velvet worms. If I can get some here and make it work, you know, have some shipped to me and have that work out all through the proper channels and everything. I would totally do well, but worms are very cool. And Newt, I like it. Yeah, they'll digest mouse bones. They can't do chitin. It's kind of funny. So, oh, Connor used to catch California red sided. That'd be cool. And yeah, I would love to have that species someday. I don't right now, but I would love to. Um, and there you go, Frank. He didn't digest it. That's right. And Therapod Hunter, this is actually Lemon Button Fern, which I believe, I, I could be totally wrong on this, but I'm thinking it's pretty closely related to the Boston Fern. And Arthropod Ambassadors. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Um, Richard from Tarantula Collective is awesome. He... Uh, I've interviewed him on the channel, so if you haven't seen that, we did a live stream... Was it in September, I think it was? Or no? Yeah, I think it was September. We did a live stream together, and we'll be doing uh, a podcast soon together. And I'm glad that uh, he, we actually talked about that with his uh, Porcelia Hoffman's egg guy a little bit. So that's cool. Yeah, yeah, she's kind of chunky. It's true. This guy, on the other hand, has stayed pretty small. Hmm. So Frank the Tank, you've seen him eat a lot of grasshoppers, but not digesting them. Interesting. So Trisha, I am working on breeding these guys, uh, these guys and gal, I should say. Um, they have been mating, and I was fairly convinced they were going to have a litter because they started mating in June. I thought I was going to get a fall clutch or a fall litter, but I didn't. 
So I think uh, in the spring, once they have brew mated, they, they have been mating a lot even lately. So I think this uh, late spring, around June, I should be getting some babies. So I am uh, going to be breeding them, yes. Hoffman's egg eye are awesome. I've got um, a couple of different, two different uh, localities of Hoffman's egg eye. I've got just the normal nominate form, and then I've got the black uh, Hoffman's egg eye that I got from Finger Lakes Feeders. And I'm excited. They're all pretty young still, the ones I got from Finger Lakes Feeders, but they're doing their thing. So, okay, so what I would like to do. I actually want to show you my Porcelio Hoffman's Egg Eye Black because the the um, snakes aren't doing a ton and I think it would be fun to show you that. So let's see what I could do. And Kilkes, thanks for coming. Um, I'm happy to have you as long as I can and that is awesome that you came. So thank you again. Let's see. So goldfish, uh, not goldfish, what am I talking about? Garter snakes are pretty easy to breed. Partly because you don't have to worry about um, handling eggs, really. You can just uh, keep males and females together. They're communal, so you don't have to worry about that so much. And then uh, suddenly you have, as long as you're taking good care of them, you get a, a litter of babies. just shows up. And generally they don't eat them either, but you do want to get them out of there as soon as you can. But, yeah, they're pretty easy. Um, let's see. A pied hoff. I've seen a picture of a pied hoff, and I've also um, seen a picture of an orange one. See these? Oh, the light is kind of crummy, but those are black Hoffman's egg eye. Young ones, like I said. Quite young. Um, I'm going to see if I can change the lighting, because uh, I want you to get a better look at these. He sent me some good numbers, too. I mean, he definitely did not skimp on them. So, hold on just a second. I'm going to maneuver the lights just a little. And see if I can get this to work. And there's Houdini doing his thing up there. Kind of fun. He's coming out again. They're very, like I said, they're curious. And as long as I'm playing around their enclosure, they usually don't uh, care to go back in too much. I mean, usually one or two of them will stay out and kind of hang out and see what's going on. So that's always fun. Okay, so I'm going to move the um, camera here. Wow, what's going on? Okay, going to move it over here. Sorry, I know that's kind of nuts doing that part. We're going to look at a few isopods because we're here and we can. Just pardon the the wiggly moving part, because you're going to end up looking at all my storage shelves, which is not as exciting as looking at isopods. But there you go. All right, let's take a look here. What we got going on? That ought to do it. Okay. Get a better look at these Porcelio Huffman's Guy Black. As you can see, They've got slightly narrower uh, bands of white or skirts of white around their body, which is pretty cool. And let's see, look how many, he really sent me a good number of them. There must be like 20 or something in here, which is awesome. We did a little bit of a trade. I'm going to experiment. Uh, just a touch more with the the focus and so on. If I put my uh, glasses on, that ought to help me figure out what you can see. Oh yeah, that's not bad. It's not showing up too badly. Um, so so garters can do well in a semi-aquatic setup. Theropod hunter, um, they can, but. It has to be done right, and it's not the easiest thing in the world to do right, I guess. Um, if garters are in a setup where they cannot dry off thoroughly um, and frequently whenever they need to, they will get um, sores on their skin and stuff like that. So you just have to be really careful to make sure that they do have that opportunity. 
Um, so there are lots of types of pied isopods like dairy cows, Dalmatians, um, many others. There's a Nazatum version, there's Shiro Utsuri, the Cubaris species that may or may not be naturally pied, I'm not sure, but it is a pied isopod anyway. Um, T. Rafki has one. There's a lot. And Newt. Actually, I did until yesterday, and I dumped a whole bunch in my uh, dairy cow enclosure, because this is where I keep my leaves over here, um, on these, these baking pans. Here's my baking pan where I bake my leaves. And I just... That big full pan went to my dairy cows, because they needed some. They were in need of leaves. Um, so do I sell isopods? Yes, I do. I sell quite a few on my website. Nefarious Toff. What kind of oak leaves are best for isopods? Just about any oak leaf is great for isopods, honestly. Um, I like to use a mix of leaves. Oak is a great one to include in that mix. Apparently, uh, the better you're off, the more of a mix you can get, the better off you are, because the isopods themselves um, thrive on, you know, the, the, the variety of diet, which kind of makes sense. And the leaves, uh, different leaves decompose at different speeds. And the tougher leaves are, you know, they take longer to decompose, like a lot of oaks are that way. Magnolia leaves are that way. And that's a good thing. But then you also want some softer leaves that decompose a little faster. I wanted to take a peek at the uh, Porcelli ornatus high yellow and see how they're doing. I saw a female that looked like she was carrying manka in a marsupium the other day, and uh, just thought I'd pop in here and take a look and see what we can see. Love this this morph. It's I mean, well, it's a locality more than a morph, I guess, kind of both, because they've been selectively bred for high yellow for a while. Um, not seeing any babies right now, but that doesn't mean they're not in here. Let's see, a whole bunch of springtails, which is good. Um, let's see, what do we got here? Oh, there's a whole bunch of the high yellows in here. I don't see any babies per se, but uh, there's some down there, but I don't want to disturb them. I have to be careful. I don't want to crush them. That's like the worst when you're maneuvering isopods around and you accidentally crush one. It has happened to me and I hate it. I absolutely hate that. Um, so I try to be really careful to avoid it, but... Should we take a peek at the magic potions in the California mix? While I'm over here um, by the bin, I think I think maybe we should. Let's see. Um, let's see. Catching up. So Heather Jensen, that's kind of what I'm doing with my scabers. I have um, my lottery mix or whatever you call it um, that I created a long time ago by putting orange with Dalmatian, and there's calico in there. There's Orange Dalmatian, there's Dalmatian, there is, uh, there's a couple of pides in there I put in. So I'm hoping that that will eventually be fun. Okay, so Nefarious Toff, you're welcome, and thank you. Hello, Toilet Pete. So Forest Oasis, would it be safe to use wood collected from the woods for frogs? Probably I'm not sure if it's hardwood or not. Well, that is a good question. I would say... Um, if it's if you collect it in a place where basically all you're seeing is oak and maple, which is what you'll get in the lower elevations of the canyons around here, and forest oasis is local, that's prob you're probably a pretty safe bet you're getting hardwood. And if you bake it really well, you're probably going to be okay. That's that's the rule I follow. If you're going up higher and you're getting into the uh, places where there's a lot of um, like fir trees and stuff, then mm, you might not be quite as safe to, to pick some out. Look at all those magic potions. So hopefully you've seen my recent video on magic potions. That was fun. At least I thought it was fun to do. Magic potions are a really fun isopod. And you're right, Newt. There are a lot of fun words. Monkai, marsupium, perion, pleon, um, pleopods, periopods. So many fun words. It's true. And Albatross Gaming. Yeah, I actually have some redwood trees here, too. And I bake them as well. Have you ever had any of those magic isopods take off on their little brooms? 
Not that I've noticed, but that's, you know, just because I haven't seen it doesn't mean it hasn't happened. I mean, could very well be. So you collected an in Indiana mix of both trice with trees and forests, leaning towards hardwood, though. Okay, well, you're probably reasonably safe, but... So, Heather, yeah, your potions from before the ones from the gem mix. I think that's so cool, and I think it's so cool that they are... Um, they seem to be more curious. That is that is fascinating to me, since they're genetically closely related to, very closely related to the other ones. So Catherine, now that's a good idea. You should get uh, get some magic potions sometime soon, once you're confident with the ones you have. Yeah, that's a good way to do it. Build up some some confidence with what you're working with first. Makes sense. Ray, so you found a red vulgar in the wild. That's awesome. Um. So Therapod Hunter, I was talking to someone, who was it? Someone who had some emerald cockroaches. Very cool. Very beautiful. You know what, Heather, you're the one who um, really um, piqued my interest in um, gem mix. I really, really want to get gem mix now because they sound, sound awesome. I mean, uh, not just now, before when we were talking about it is when it started, but every time you talk about it, I'm just fascinated. I want to, I want to get into there. So look at this, this one on the right. It looks like a milk back, but kind of like an, to me it looks sort of orange. Am I right? And this is the California mix. They come in all sorts of different colors. Would you call that orange? That's what it looks like to me. Um, Do I ever do videos outside about the ISOs in your area? Huh, maybe I should. I haven't done that, but I should. I mean, some of the isopods that I have, I've collected nearby. Like my high yellow line started there. And oh, look at the monka. Well, it's not a monka anymore. It's just a juvenile because the monka, as soon as uh, it molts, the first time it's no longer a, a monka. But uh, I just saw a juvenile tiny one there so can they eat green grapes I would be uh, careful with grapes not because grapes are a terrible food for them or anything but just because um, grapes often have a lot of pesticides on them so I would be careful with that and snailiontologist I think you're right especially the gem mix well, look at these four are just eating a what I believe is a fish food pellet. That's cool. We can watch them munch. I love it. So, Reyes, in a sense, these are kind of like a calico version of, Le of Levis in that they are a, a very, a variety that throws a lot of different colors. It's, they're all the same from the same genetic line, but they throw a lot of different colors. So whatever morph, I mean, whatever genetically is going on here, they do that, which is really cool. I love California mix. Let's see, yeah, a couple of them look kind of like a peach or a um, caramel or a orange, people are saying. And I'm not sure what the pattern is at the bottom. I, I really don't want to check because I'm afraid I'd hurt them. But that would be interesting. And I would totally do that. I mean, I guess in my videos, that I, my herping videos that I've done recently, I've always found some inverts too. So I could just do a straight invert video where I go out and look for some. Which is cool. And all right. Sweet potato. They love sweet potato for sure. How to stop them from going into water? That's hard to do. I don't give mine water dishes at all. Because uh, someone will just jump into water in an enclosure, like a, a cleanup crew, you know? Someone will do that. It's hard to stop them. Nugget the Destroyer has roly polies. Cool. So inverting, I like it. Kind of sounds like I'm going to stand on my head, which I might actually do while I'm flipping rocks to some extent. But can you try breeding orange Dalmatian Porcelio scaber? Like you mean starting from the beginning? Because I've actually done that. I wasn't the first to produce them, but I was probably the second or third person to produce um, orange Dalmatians years ago, before you know a lot of other things were popular in the hobby, honestly, and. Uh, Ryan Orr was the first one to do it, and when he uh, 
when he was talking about it and had was just starting the process, I was communicating with him on like dart frog forums and stuff. And that's so I have done it, and it's fun. It's, it was fun to produce them. The first generation of uh, offspring were pretty much all gray with a few calicos, which was kind of a surprise. But uh, yeah, it was it was pretty cool. It's fun to to watch. Let's check out the Armadillidium du, uh, klugai dubrovniks, shall we? The red face. Got some red faces in here, and they're very very cool. I'm hoping to get some babies soon. You can see some springtails in there, but that's all I'm seeing. Yellow powder orange ice pods. Um, that's really cool. Actually, you should, Raceland, you should work with those. You should isolate those and see what you get, because that could be something unique. Totally could be. I mean, I can't say for sure because I can't see them, but they could be a unique thing. So I would work with those. Get those isolated. Having trouble focusing a little bit. So they can get sick. They can get parasites and whatnot. It, it can happen. So my arachnids will, let's see, my uh, Phidippus regius and Phidippus uh, audax spiders are doing pretty well. The weather is cooling down and they're starting to calm down a little bit, like spend more time in their, in their hides and stuff like that. Starting to do that. But they are doing pretty well. My tailless whip scorpion is doing well. I'm uh, actually going to be working on a video with that species soon. And check this out. Check out that big old Porcelio expanses. A couple of big ones right there. That seems to be a female. Big female there. And so inbreeding, there's some uh, some uh, differences of opinion going on with that, I think. Check out these guys. Love the expenses. If I had to pick a favorite uh, giant Spanish species, this would probably... Probably it. Klugai variants take longer to give monkey. Oh, well, see, that's good to know. Oh, Jordan, that's awesome. Thank you. Really appreciate the super chat. They really keep me going. You know, these isopods here were a gift from Jordan, too. He sent me my first stock, and they've been breeding really, really well. As you can see, there's some younger ones in there. Um... So I got a, I got Jordan to thank for these guys. So thank you, Jordan. You're awesome. Do I have any frogs? I do. I have some uh, Leucomelis, Dendrobates Leucomelis dart frogs, for example. Um, yeah, basement pets. These are so cool. When I have guests come over and stuff, we talk about how they they remind everybody of trilobites, like trilobites with a cool pattern, you know. Of course, they're not closely related to trilobites at all, but they, they look something like them. Reminiscent. So substrate, my substrate is typically organic compost, oak pellets that have been soaked uh, into sawdust, wet sawdust, and the, the leaves. And then, of course, I do the, the hydration station with the moss that you can see here. So the expanses really like concave bark to hang out in. Um, they, they typically don't hang out, you know, out in the moss. I think they're doing that because it's kind of the evening, like this big old female here. Um, I think it's a female. It could be a young male, I guess. It's got some uropods that are a little maybe inconclusive there. But um, they're really going to town. And there are more in here than we can see. I mean, every piece of wood that I lift up has... A number under there and then there you pick up some smaller piece of wood and there are tiny little juveniles under them they're they're everywhere which is so cool like i said probably my favorite giant spanish porcelia maybe my favorite ice pod if i had to pick one it might be this one it's really super hard to pick of course but i just adore them 
I think they're super cool. Let's see. A rubber ducky is worth the money. That is entirely um, a matter of opinion, I guess. So if you're asking my opinion, I would say they're super cool. They, they were a real pain when I first got them because they weren't breeding for me for a while. But I, I feel glad that I got them now that they're breeding you know, and doing pretty well. Um, hopefully that helps. So, oh, Newt, you have a pet trilobite that's also a pet rock. That makes sense. That makes sense. Let's see if I can um, I'll try to focus down on here and see if we can see any of the little guys. I want to be really careful because when I pick up the pieces of limestone, I don't want to crush anybody. Oh, there's a bunch down there, but I don't know if you can see them. Well, you can see a couple of them down there. I can see three ish down there in that hole and here's one on the there's a couple of them on the rock there a bigger one on the top and then a small one down at the bottom and then there's one inside that hole and now there's two inside that hole so what is the ratio of compost to soaked pellets yes i'm aiming for about one third compost one third of the wood pellets i think sometimes the wood pellets are a little less than that, though, honestly. Um, and what just happens, you know, it turns out to be less than that. But I don't think it's a huge deal. They need the wood, I think. It's it's very beneficial for them. Sorry, I'm just trying to scoot this. Um, the baby rubber duckies out of the way so I don't crush them. They've been growing really pretty fast, um, the little babies in here. A lot faster than they did the first time I was doing this. If I were to start isopods, so I look for some outside. We are all gamers. You certainly could do that. Um, oh, there's a little tiny baby. It's kind of dark in there where it is, but you see a little tiny baby isopod. So, I mean, rubber ducky. There's probably, I think, th at least three clutches of rubber duckies in here, which is pretty cool. Um, you could totally go outside and get some. Uh, if you, It just depends on whether you want to, you know, how fancy you want to get. I wish I could focus on the, the isopods a little bit more easily. This one's doing its thing, pretty visible. So, hmm. So Jordan, it's the same batch. I didn't have to add any. They started reproducing soon after I got them, and they grew really fast. <sighs> um, and Heather, I agree. You know, it's it's just the one that uh, what you're into. So Jordan, these are all from your stock that you. You got for me. And New York ant keeping. Definitely have considered ant keeping. In fact, I kept ants for about three years. That was about 20-ish years ago. And I would totally do it again. I probably will at some point. Now I've kind of caused a problem for myself because there are these little tiny rubber duckies wandering around right under where I need to set this piece of limestone. So I'm just going to wait for a minute. We can watch this guy walk around while I do that, I guess. <laughs> um... So garter snakes don't really eat isopods, at least not very often, to um, how to. So what do the isopods eat, Casey? Basically leaf litter and compost and little bits of fruits and vegetables, little bits of fish food, that kind of stuff. So New York ant keeping, the species of ant that I kept, I'm not even sure. I just collected it locally when they were queening. You know, I found one of the queens after it had lost its wings after the nuptial flight. And actually, I think I collected three or four of them, put them together. I did the test tube setup, you know, the DIY test tube setup um, with the cotton and the, the air tubing and all the different things. Put them in there. Okay, I think I can almost put this back now that all the ice pods are, you know, hiding in there. Um, but there's one more <coughs> little one in there that I need to wait for it to move. And uh, yeah, they just... The queens stayed together for a while. One killed all the others. And then she started producing workers. And I kept them for about three years. And Albatross Gaming. I have crested geckos right now. Yep. Um, and people grow isopods along with garter snakes as a cleanup crew. That is, that's the reasoning behind that. They work great to help 
get rid of feces and shed skins and stuff like that. So that is why they do that. Okay, I am going to take a look and see how the uh, Oreo crumbles are doing, shall we? I really like the Oreo crumbles a lot, and I want to see how they're doing. And, oh, am I putting it in upside down? No, I'm doing okay. Love how that, the magnets just snap into place on this tarantula cribs enclosure. Very cool enclosures. Love these. It's really nice of tarantula uh, cribs to send me some to try out. And I'm loving them. Uh, they work really well. I haven't had any problems with them. And they're so nice for viewing your ice pods. I mean, you can't really beat them. You know, you you got to put ice pods in there that'll take advantage of the... Uh, I mean, ice pods that are visible. Otherwise, you're kind of, you know, not taking advantage of the visibility if you put ice pods that are really secretive in there. But if you put ice pods... That is the first... Good shot of a baby Oreo crumbles that I've had right there. Check it out. Center stage, folks. So um, I thought I saw one in the leaf litter the other day. Wasn't sure. But that is the first confirmed uh, Oreo crumble, which is a... Oh, there's an, another one. Or Yeah, that is another one. I was thinking it was a springtail for a minute. It was moving so fast. But nope, we've got Monkai in there. They're doing great. This is so exciting. So. What land ice pods can live in water? Well, none of them can live in water uh, indefinitely. None of the land ones can, as far as I know. But there are some that can survive a long time underwater. Uh, but none of them that I would say, okay, well, you can keep these aquatically. There are even, uh, there are semi-aquatic ice pods, of course. And a lot of those are found on the shores of the ocean, basically, at the beach. Um, there's Ligia exotica, which is found, for example, in the southeast along the coast. I, I saw some of those when I was down in Florida a few years ago. They're super cool. They're very big, very active, very aware. They almost are not like uh, isopods at all because they're, they're so aware of what you're doing. And it feels like isopods are sort of vaguely aware, oh, there's a big thing and it's moving and it's, I'm going to run away. But these are like hyper aware of where you are and everything, which is pretty cool. And so how to, we, I put the garters away, but maybe I'll, I'll check them out again. They were out for the first part of the live stream and uh, we'll see what they're doing. Maybe some of them are out. I can see Ruby kicking around, so maybe we'll take her out again. Um, but that's so exciting. I am so excited that there are little uh, juveniles running around in the Oreo Crumbles enclosure. That is so cool. Sorry. I just have to pop this lid shut. I love that the, the lids are so solid. I mean, there's, there's no way anything's getting out of that. I was, you could put a centipede in there, which is saying something. It's very cool. So I'm going to switch the camera around. We'll go uh, check out the garters and see how they're doing again. I can see some of them running around. So let's, let's take a look. Well, running, I guess. Not having legs, they can't really run. But there's Ruby in the back there doing her thing. And so Oreo crumbles do look a lot like tiny dairy cows, which is awesome. And they are Porcelionides prunosus, the species uh, known as the powder blue. The wild type is known as the powder blue. And Santiago Orozco, hello. Welcome. And Brian Orr, you will most likely have some isopods do okay, but if you add some leaf litter, they will do better. Oh, that's cool. I, I'll be interested in seeing what happens with that, Heather. So, WMN. Some people do take garter snakes from the wild. I I vastly uh, prefer, you know, captive bred ones. See, this is the, the curiosity of these guys, that they will come right out and just kind of say hi, which I love. Um, so, captive bred is better. 
And these are from Don's garter snakes, these, these garters here. And I love snakes too. They're one of my favorite animals. See how curious they are. I love it. Yeah. Captive bred is so much better for a lot of reasons. Um, oh no, Beckett. Yes, the tiger centipedes are escape artists for sure. I'm going to watch him climb up here. Houdini's one of his favorite spots right up here. Of course, basking spot. In the morning, they're always coming up here and doing their thing. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that, Beckett. I hope you're able to recover it. They do desiccate pretty fast. But uh, hopefully you're able to, to find it. Look at this. Look at that face. I love it. <laughs> See, now the, the downside here is that when I'm doing the live stream, the camera angles are such that it's really hard to um, hold the snakes and film at the same time. But look at this. This is courtship behavior going on back here. We've got Rufus and Ruby. And they're, they're doing a lot of that right now, which is normal right before they go down for brumation. So, yeah, beetle jelly fish food with the leaf litter is a pretty good way to go. Albatross Gaming. Brian Davidson, welcome. We're actually going to open up uh, the questions up to Patreon because somehow I skipped that and I don't want to. So Patreon, they're going to be about 51 minutes, the Patreon questions, because we, we had some. Let's see, I think. I'm not sure how many we had. Okay, this is, this is for you, Brian. This is answer to your question on Patreon. Any advice on how to prune and maintenance a natural enclosure with morning geckos and not having them escape? Depends on the enclosure. And with your enclosure, that's going to be a little tricky. But I would say that... Um, <laughs> I would say that it's going to come down to habituation when the geckos are used to having you um, interact with the enclosure. They're not going to care as much. And uh, with that particular enclosure, since you're opening it from the top, it's, you know, they are going to hang out at the top sometimes. And that's going to be pretty tricky. Um, aquascaping pruning scissors would be some help. And, uh, Tweezers of the same type, long forceps. Um, but I think the habituation is going to be key. And then when you move them into a, a top opening enclosure, it's not going to be nearly as difficult. So hopefully that helps. If, if, uh, if it does, let me know. And if it's not, I'll see if I can um, explain, some, explain it a little better, hopefully. So this is a 40-gallon enclosure for this trio here. Sedge Hammer doing water change and watching the snake. Awesome. Yeah, Ambrose, uh, the mailing list, yeah, I, I know what you mean. Uh, I mean, the waiting list can be really long. I got these from Don's Garter Snakes. Wow, I think they might actually be mating back there. He's trying, for sure. Um, so if they go to the bathroom on the cork bark, how do you clean it? Well, I usually get like a spray bottle and just really spray it down so it goes down into the soil so the ice buds can take care of it. Do you ever give your snakes little hats? That would be cool if we could make it work if they would actually stay on their heads. And Raceland, that's awesome. I would appreciate that a lot. Okay. And Brian Orr, that's a good suggestion. And excellent, Brian. Um, they do eat mice. They eat uh, frozen thawed pinkies. I give them large pinkies right now. They're the size where the large pinkies are what, they, uh, what they're eating. And they usually eat between one and four at a time. And Don's Garter Snake produced these little guys. I got them when they were about a month old. From him at the Reptile Expo back in 2019. It was in September. So I've had them a little over a couple months over a year now and they are about, uh, what would that make them? Like 15 months old, I guess. About. Okay. What is the blue wrench? Blue wrench is a, a signal that someone is a moderator. So, Brian, cool news for those who uh, can't keep rodents in the house. Um, so, if... So, Joy is terrified of rodents. 
Does that extend to frozen rodents? I, I'm assuming it does. Um, well, I would say you can successfully keep garters without rodents. There are some other options. Like I have fed these guys um, reptilinks, and those are whole animal prey that has been ground up and encased in a, a sausage style casing, basically. And garters can do really well in that because it's made from whole rabbits and whole quail and things like that. And they can do well on that. They can also do well on thiaminase free fish. Um, they can do well with earthworms that have been supplemented with calcium and vitamins. So that you have some options. Um, yeah. So Heather Jensen, I think you could do a really cool photo shoot with the little hats for your amphibians. That would be cool. Um, so yeah, and I just use frozen rodents. I never feed my snakes live rodents from for several reasons. One is because uh, you know, there's no need to do that to the poor rodents uh, if you, they'll take the frozen ones, which they will. I mean, frozen thawed, of course. Um, so there's that. I also would personally feel bad about feeding them live rodents uh, because we've kept pet rodents. We love rats around here, and mice look a lot like rats, even though they don't act much like them. So, um, so yeah, the earthworms can work with the uh, calcium and vitamin supplementation. Um, tilapia fillets can work, add a little calcium and vitamins there too, that kind of thing. So you have wild P. Levis white in your backyard. That's awesome. You could try to isolate them. And snailiontologist, yeah, egg eaters. There are egg eating snakes that you can get. They're pretty cool. So there's a, there are a lot of options with garters. Part of the reason I wanted to get into garters was because I didn't have to feed rodents, but then, um, I found that it wasn't that big of a deal to keep frozen rodents in the in the uh, freezer as long as I kept them covered up. Um, my wife knows about it. She knows they're there, but she doesn't have to look at them, so it works out. And let's see, Catherine says her isopods are breeding. She just saw some really tiny monkey come out to eat the mealworm skins. That's awesome. Yep, frozen thawed silver sides. If you get the right kind that are thiaminase free, salmon, yep. So there you go. Well, I have about three minutes and hopefully I was able to successfully answer your question, Brian. I think you uh, answered that, if I recall that it was, that I was able to address some of it. So that's good. Does anybody else have questions that they'd like me to cover? So Jackson Gillespie's in the house. Nice. We've got a good like spike going on. So guppies can be decent feeder fish because they don't appear to have the issue with thiaminase and they breed quickly. Um, I actually breed endlers, which are very similar, but um, I have not really used those for my these garters at all. Um, so ferns, this is Korean rock fern. See, look at this courtship activity right here. That's, what, that's what's going on here. Um, this is lemon button fern. This is bird's nest fern, Leslie cultivar. Um, yeah, so this is, the snakes are definitely, yeah, definitely courtship behavior going on. Um, escape proof enclosure do you suggest for centipedes? Um, there are a couple of options there. I honestly, I think I'm going to try a tarantula cribs enclosure with the magnetic closures for a centipede in the near future. Um, I would also say that you can use a gallon jar for a uh, scolopendra polymorpha. Um, you can, um, then, then it's high enough that they can't really get out as long as you don't make the substrate too high. And then you also put a, a nice lid on it. Those are a couple of options. I have used gasket lids on plastic containers that have the gasket seal and, and the lockdown. Those work. That will, something of that nature anyway. Can morning geckos work in a 20 long? Yes, but I wouldn't recommend, I would recommend making it vertical, vertical, uh, Adapt it for a vertical kit, you know, use a vertical ad adaptation kit, whatever they call them, conversion kit, because then um, they'll be able to make use of that height because they do like to do that. So, and I have kept aquatic ice buds. They're actually the first type that I kept and they're cool. They're a little different um, interacting with them. 
But yeah, they can work pretty well. And thank you, Rochant. Nice to hear that. Oh yes, um, isopods love pumpkins. So if you've got a clean source of insecticide-free pumpkin, good thing to do. Centipedes aren't for beginners. When is a keeper no longer considered a beginner? <laughs> well, I think once you've had some experience with some arachnids, and you've been successful with arachnids for a year or two, then you could try centipedes. Centipedes are not arachnids, but they share some characteristics. You know, you have the the potential for being envenomated that you have with share with some arachnids. You have the ability to escape and quick movements, things like that. So even though centipedes are diplopods and specifically chylopods, not arachnids, they are, you know, a lot of some of the faster uh, arachnids that can bite are pretty good preparation. And albatross gaming, no, you can have uh, a male and two males and a female is, is fairly common ratio when you're breeding garters. You can do it the other way too. It works. And I don't think they actually locked up this time, but I'm not sure. I can't really tell where they are. But uh, it's hard to say. In this case, they're mm, obscured in the foliage. But I'm, I have high hopes that I'm going to get some babies in, uh, in June. Some little Houdinis. And uh, most of my millipedes are doing really well. I've got lots of Hiltonius pulchris and lots of bumblebee millipedes. Hopefully my... Uh, Spiritus streptus species one will be breeding soon. Uh, so I'm just looking at the clock and thinking, oh, I've got to go. It's time. So thank you, everybody, for joining in. Thank you, Jordan, for the super chat. Thank you, moderators, for keeping the uh, live stream safe. And I'll see you all really soon. Thanks a lot.